Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Eirik, welcome to my studio and to my YouTube channel. You are watching an excerpt, a short section of my Patreon exclusive series, available to my patrons who support me with $5 or more. The full length video is over 40 minutes long and full of valuable information. To see the full episode you have to go on my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash There is a link in the description below. You have to be a Patreon supporter of $5 or more in order to see the videos. Once you become a supporter, you will instantly have access to the videos. You will find the videos by clicking the post button here. The videos should appear if you have pledged $5 or more. You can refine your search at the top of the page here. For now, however, sit back, relax, enjoy some royalty-free music, and me sculpting the structural core of my half-life size sculpture. Let's thank today's sponsors, my Patreon supporters on Patreon, who have ensured the continued existence of this channel and allowed me to upgrade my gear bit by bit, making better looking and better sounding content for all of you watching. If you are interested in supporting the channel or perhaps interested in getting personal feedback on your sculptures from me, then Patreon is the place for you. You'll get in-depth feedback on techniques and how you can apply them to your own work. Anything sculpture related goes, we can talk about armatures, supplies, mold making, Anything you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, there is a link in the description below. Thank you so much to those of you who have given generously and supported me. It really means the world. Before we start talking about the box and the egg, however, let's begin with orienting our armature properly. We did that at the end of the last episode. This keeps the armature inside our figure, inside the clay. I'll explain exactly what this means and what I'm trying to accomplish by doing this while fulfilling a promise from last episode. And that is to tell you guys about some solutions to solving half life size scale. And to go along with the explanation, there are some diagrams so you can easily understand what I'm talking about. Let's start with a method that we actually use at the Florence Academy of Art. This would be the one to use when you have no measurements from the model. I'm talking about proper measurements taken with calipers and tape measures. The method requires only comparative measurements, which you can do from a distance. It's a very useful way of solving the issues of scale when you have an inflexible armature that you cannot move up and down. This method does end up tweaking the accuracy of the half scale a little bit depending on the height of your model and the height of your armature. A shorter model might end up being a little bigger than half life size, and a taller model might end up being a little bit smaller than half life size. To begin with, we have the armature and our model. We have no way of knowing where to begin, nothing is right at the moment. So we have to begin somewhere and we start off by setting up the pelvis, or as we will call it and represent it, a box. We know we want the pole of our armature to come out of the side of the box, the side of the buttocks. This is a good place for it to exit as there is no small or fine modeling going on there, only big forms that are easily fixed in the eventual casting of the sculpture. So our box should be placed above the pole a little bit. But not so far above it that the armature will show through at the crotch. The height of the box is not yet known but we can make a guess and adjust later. The width of the box sets the scale of your figure. If the width of the box is very narrow, the figure will need to be shorter. If the box is wide, the figure will need to be taller in order for the box to be in the proper relationship to the height of your figure. The width of the box represents the width of the pelvis and we want to be pretty much set right at the beginning so we can trust this width as we progress forward, meaning we don't want to underbuild or overbuild for that matter this width. We want to get pretty much spot on, as close as we can. To find the width of the box, we compare the width of our model's pelvis, represented by our box, to the length of his standing leg from the aces down. On our model, the aces represents the two outer corners of the box. The aces are not the widest points on the pelvis, however, as you can see. 
but on most people they are very very obvious very easy to see and easy to find and because they are slightly inside the widest point of the pelvis means that we have room to grow outwards from the width of the box as well which becomes key later on when we begin sculpting contours. It changes from model to model, but around 3.5 to 4.5 pelvic widths, it's usually what will fit within the height from aces to the ground. Remember to get a good distance away from your model when making this measurement, so perspective distortion doesn't break your measurement. You should be further away from the model than the model is tall to be sure of eliminating as much distortion as possible. For the keen-eyed viewer, you might have already spotted that the two aces points sit at an angle to each other. This is because in a contraposto, which is a position where most of the body's weight rests on one leg, the pelvis will tilt. It will raise on the side that carries the weight. We will represent the tilt of our model's pelvis in our sculpted box. The ground level is set by our base. We obviously can't go lower than our base. And to make the most out of our armature, we make our figure as tall as we can. In other words, we grow the width of our clay pelvis until it is wide enough to take four widths flipped vertically and measure downwards to the ground four times, matching our model. Now, there are three more bony landmarks we can find, and we should find, before we start sculpting properly. We traveled down the body, and now it's time to travel up. But before we do that, we must find the knee. This begins with having the box tilted from the side view. As you can see here, this is what we will end up with at the end of the video. The tilt is not random, however. It corresponds with the angle between the aces in the front and the pieces in the back. The pieces can be seen in the back of your model as two shadows, usually right above the sacrum or tailbone. They are the end of the pelvic crest. The aces is the beginning of the pelvic crest. The A in ACES stands for anterior, which means front, and the P in pieces stands for posterior, which means back. Here you can see the angle between them, and usually it can be observed from side view, even though you might have to tilt back and forth a little bit to, to see them. With the box representing this tilt on our sculpture, we can find the knee. Observing from the back view, we usually find that this angle break on the inside of the knee sits about halfway between the bottom of the sacrum and the ground. The bottom of the sacrum is right where the crease between the buttocks begins. This distance does change from person to person, however. Sometimes it's a different angle break in the knee that corresponds with halfway. By using comparative measurements, however, you'll find which one works on your particular model. Take this half distance and travel upwards by jumping from the bottom of the sacrum to the pieces, measure the same length as from the bottom of the sacrum to the knee, and you will reach the C7. The C7 for the uninitiated is a very prominent vertebra, and you can find it by looking to where the two trapezius muscles or neck muscles are pointing to. And you will be surprised how often this work, and if it doesn't work exactly, say the torso is a little longer than usual, you can adjust accordingly quite easily by simply making the torso, making the C7 sit a little higher. At this stage, it's more about getting things somewhat in the right place than getting things exactly in the right place. Now we have pretty much height and length, with some major bony landmarks figured out, and the width of our pelvis. This helps 
tremendously, and it makes the beginning stages much more manageable. I will be using a slightly different method, however. I know the height of my model's crotch, which is usually half the model's overall height, and I double checked that as well, so I know my model's height and the height of my model's crotch. I also know the width of my model's pelvis. Because I'm aiming to make a perfect half life size sculpture, I need to know at least the width of my model's pelvis so I can make that perfectly scaled to my model. The crotch is represented by the bottom of the box. I know the bottom of the box must clear the armature because I don't want armature sticking out of my sculpture's crotch, of course. I can measure down from this point to find the ground level. Remember, I know the exact height of my figure's crotch. If I remember correctly, I think it's 39 centimeters or so on my sculpture, from the crotch to the ground level. I can't show you, obviously, because showing my model's crotch would be somewhat inappropriate, but if you measure from the crotch to the ace's points, you will find a triangle. Depending on the model, you'll find a triangle that's narrow and tall, or perhaps one that's wide and flat. This is a pretty good indicator for the height of the model's pelvis, and it's a trick that I often use to find where I should place the crotch. Now in this case I used it in the opposite direction, to move upwards to the ace's points. Remember, the top two corners of the box are the ones that mean something. We'll get back to this a little bit later. Now I can use comparative measurement and double check with the width of my pelvis, turning the width vertically and checking how many times the width fits into the height, from aces to the ground. If I've measured correctly, everything should be working out at this point, and I should have no discrepancies. From here, I can use the method described above to find the knee and the height of the C7, setting my scale and allowing me to begin sculpting while respecting and paying attention to these landmarks so I don't lose them or move them by accident. Just to quickly reiterate, there are many ways to solve the issue of finding your bony landmarks and setting up your sculpture. This is my way of doing things, which is a slightly modified way of what I was taught at the Florence Academy of Art and what I now teach at the Florence Academy of Art. Minor things are different, it's mainly the exact same way. Couple of things to notice. Only the top two corners on the front of the box represents anything as far as the corners of the box go. The bottom corners and the top corners on the back of the box represents nothing. On the back of the box, the only thing that represents something concrete are the two pieces points closer to the middle of the box. The drawing of the sacrum on the back of the box is not set in stone, but it helps drawing it on there to figure out the overall height, as we described above. Keep in mind, all of this will get you close. If done carefully, you'll probably get within a few millimeters. But a few millimeters makes a big difference, especially in this small scale. You have to be prepared to change things and move things based on what you observe visually from your model. Measurements are a good way to get started, but it's not the end-all be-all. The only one I'm probably going to stick with religiously is the width of the box. Every other width can be compared to this width. It is our original decision and the one thing that we will always and can always come back to if we somehow end up in trouble. Hopefully the above describes some of what is going on in my head, going through my head as I'm beginning to sculpt this. As you can see, I take my time and I'm careful. If these early steps are done right, I'm set up for the rest of the project. If I do this wrong, I'll be fighting it the entire way, struggling to get things right and get things in the right place. With a good setup, the process becomes more linear and we avoid going in circles. If you enjoyed the video and want to learn sculpture from me, check out my Patreon page. I give feedback and critiques on people's work and we talk about whatever you need help with in your sculpting endeavors.
and right now there is exclusive sculpting content on my Patreon. The first series we are embarking on is the beginner's guide to sculpting the figure. I'm super excited to finally be creating exclusive content for Patreon, and I hope you will be too and will take a look. The link to my Patreon is in the description below. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for a new video next Thursday. Hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button and share it with your friends and family. It really helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.